The CIS gets a lot of flack from Star Wars fans about its droid army, especially considering how the droids performed in the movies and in the Clone Wars, but this perhaps is rather undeserved. From an objective standpoint, the droid army wasn't a bad idea at all. There are many advantages of such a force that get swept under the rug in the films and in the Clone Wars, and today we'll be bringing them to light. In this video, we'll be discussing how the CIS droid army was actually genius. Attention, Sergeant on deck! There are a number of videos out there about the drawbacks of using battle droids as soldiers, but there are a lot of advantages as well. And on their own, in a neutral environment, the pros honestly outweigh the cons pretty heavily. Because sure, droids aren't usually capable of improvisation and the models used by the CIS weren't all that intelligent, and they lacked imagination. But they had advantages too, especially when you don't know what you're going to be up against, which I remind you, the CIS really didn't. First of all, the CIS droid army was incredibly cost effective. Clone armies were expensive as heck, due to the cost of growing, training and arming soldiers from scratch, and recruited armies were little better, as you had to pay your soldiers wages on top of funding training and equipment. Battle droids were much cheaper. It cost less than 2000 credits to get yourself a combat ready B1 battle droid. For comparison, a single suit of clone armor was four times that price. It was even cheaper if the droids were built without central processors and slaved to the central control computers, though for obvious reasons, this wasn't advisable. Production of battle droids was also incredibly easy. Recruited soldiers took months to properly train and clones took years to fully grow. Both required lots of work on the part of outside personnel, plus housing and logistical funding. Droids stepped off the assembly line knowing more about combat than the average recruit, and furthermore, they were fully capable of acting on that knowledge. That's a matter of minutes as opposed to a matter of years, and in battles on separatist factory worlds, Republic forces often had to deal with the problem of needing to destroy droids faster than the enemy could make more, which wasn't always a possible task. And since the materials required to make standard CIS units were very common, production could happen anywhere. Hundreds of factory worlds across the Confederacy were easily reconfigured to churn thousands of droids each and every day, and the Genotians often set up new factories on conquered worlds that were far from supply lines. As seen at Gentes and Zadja. There was no one important source world for these droids, meaning that it would take a massive galactic scale effort just to put a dent in the droid army's supply of reinforcements. Combine all of these factors and you get a massive overwhelming advantage, numbers. The confederacy's reliance on numbers may be the butt of many a joke among Star Wars fans, but it's a lot less funny when you're outnumbered 100 to 1. Some estimates suggest that the CIS droid army outnumbered the entire galaxy, and had the Sith not been running the Clone Wars, these numbers alone would have been enough to grind the Republic to dust. No matter how skilled any soldier is, there is always a level at which numbers will simply be overwhelming for them. Sure, the Republic's Alpha class ARC troopers were better than any droid the Confederacy had, but there were only a hundred of them, and against billions of droids, the inevitable victor is pretty obvious. And since the Republic had Jedi on their side, it was actually a smart move for the Confederacy to rely so heavily on numbers. No matter how well trained your soldiers are, no matter how much money you poured into them, the odds are that the Jedi will make short work of them anyway. But in the wise words of HK47, there are few Jedi that can long hold their ground against a hundred attackers all firing at once, or being turned on by their own troops. Furthermore, droids are very easily made to adapt to new situations or environments. While they were incapable of improvisation, it was very, very easy to modify battle droids en masse to correct design flaws, eliminate bugs in coding, and eliminate shortcomings. 
To prepare for combat in an unusual environment, organic armies would require special equipment and either weeks of retraining or the usage of specialized units that have already gotten such training. The former option wastes time, the latter leaves little room for reinforcements. For droids however, all that is needed is some quick modification and a software update and you're good to go. It might not even take that. Droids are inherently more versatile than living beings, and so there are many environments for which they would just need tactical guidance. As the Confederacy's battle droids were all linked to some degree to a central control network, it was very, very, very easy for them to receive software upgrades. While eliminating shortcomings in training for organic beings would require retraining, bugs in droid programs could be corrected in seconds. Improvements to tactical code, additions to combat programming, or new battle scenarios could be implemented across the entire droid army almost immediately, and best of all, the enemy probably wouldn't even know it. Both of these factors made it nearly impossible for large-scale sabotage operations against the droid army to have any lasting effect. Computer viruses could quickly and easily be eliminated as with any other sort of software sabotage if CIS commanders caught it and figured out the nature of the problem in time. And if there was a successful case of mass software sabotage, which there were in a handful of battles, then it was very easy for coders working for the Confederacy to ensure that the same strategy never worked twice. Industrial sabotage was still a bit of a bigger threat but still a manageable one. Due to the sheer number of factories contributing to the droid army, successful sabotage on one factory or even an entire mech world would barely have a noticeable effect. Hundreds of other factories were available to pick up the slack and repairs could be made to the sabotage droids fairly quickly. Once more, there were indeed times where this sort of sabotage proved effective, but they were not all that numerous and they never did any real damage to the CIS war effort as a whole. One of the biggest advantages of a droid army is something that people rarely think about when it comes to war, unless it's their job, logistics. In combat, a Republic force of around 50,000 men consumed 2,000 tons of supplies, including food, water, ammunition, and more, during every single day of operation, and this number was often higher. Organic troops had to be clothed, fed, given water, quartered, given time for sleep, and given medical attention. After all, organic troops are living beings. They have a wide variety of basic needs that require constant attention. The same is not true for droids. All they need is power, ammunition, and a space large enough to cram a few thousand compacted units into. They require no rest. They require no food, water, or medical attention. Maintenance can even be ignored in many cases, and indeed, most CIS commanders opted not to repair their droids until after a battle unless they were low on troops. You could cram a full squad of B1s in the back of your land speeder, let it sit there for a few years without attention, and then drive over to a building and capture it. It was a level of low maintenance convenience that no organic army could ever hope to come anywhere near. Furthermore, droids are much more durable than living beings in general. They don't bleed out, they aren't hindered by pain, and they can be armored much more effectively than any organics can. And while B1 units are still about as flimsy as organics due to their light armoring, B2 units could take enough blaster bolts to kill several clones before going down. Anyone who's played Republic Commando knows just how absolutely terrifying those buggers were when there weren't any Jedi around to cut them to pieces. And horrifically, there were more durable units than B2s too. Other droids had lightsaber resistant Cortosis armor or built-in shield generators that made them more resilient to damage than any living being could ever hope to be. A common criticism of battle droids is that they lack imagination, but this can be an advantage as well. In the words of Rune Hako, droids don't talk back, they don't question orders, and they don't complain when you send them on suicide missions. Droids will carry out their orders to the best of their ability without any sort of hesitation, and there was never any need to fear morale problems or mutiny. Furthermore, the command net that connected the Confederacy's droids meant that the CIS commanders had what amounted to a droid imitation of Jedi battle meditation. 
orders were sent out immediately to all units at once and directed collectively, allowing them to carry out strategies perfectly. All of the common criticisms of battle droids, when it comes down to it, have plus sides to them. A lack of improvisation means no mutiny and no breaking from orders because a soldier thinks he has a better idea of what to do than the commander. A lack of intelligence is made irrelevant given proper command. A lack of imagination can be an asset as well as an issue. And while droids may have less skill than organic soldiers, they can overcome this purely through sheer numbers 9 times out of 10. So that's why the CIS droid army was actually pretty genius. But as per usual, I want to know what you think. Has this video changed your mind on those dirty clankers yet? Or do you still think organic armies would have been a better choice for the confederacy? Let me know in the comments section below. And just before you go guys, a big thank you to all of my current patrons. Your guys support really does help the channel out. And if you do want to join the wider Geetsleys community, make sure you check out the Discord servers where you can chat with other Star Wars fans, our Geetsleys gaming network where you can play games with other Star Wars fans, and my second channel called The Front where we discuss the niche and unknown topics of World War II. Anyways guys, as always, thank you so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next video.